Hello, linguists. Welcome to episode 4B. Last time you recall, we investigated Sir William Jones when he was stationed from England to uh, the Indian subcontinent, and he discovered that the languages he, were in, he was encountering there seemed to be related to languages like Latin and Greek from Europe. And his suggestion that the words of the non-Christian brown-skinned people there in the European colony, soon to be, uh, were related to the words of the Greek and Roman civilization, the ancestors of modern Europe. And if the words were related, then the people must be as well, which is, of course, true. We also studied the methodology for reconstructing Proto-Indo-European roots, talked about majority rules, sound erosion, um, convergent evolution, some other logical moves that we used. And we looked at a bunch of different roots for uh, uh, modern words for seven in Indo-European languages. Notice, by the way, that Proto-Indo-European is the language spoken by this people way, way long ago in the past. And Indo-European languages are languages like English or Russian, which are modern or recent descendants of that original language. Well, today, we're going to do what Leonard Nimoy did on a TV show when I was young in the 70s. That's him in the bottom of your picture. He played Spock on the original Star Trek series, and after that, he had a show called In Search Of, and they would go to Easter Island in search of the meaning of carvings on stones. Today, we're going to play In Search of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Several methodologies have been proposed for figuring out exactly who these people were. The first was based on an observation. The Indic languages of, of northern India seem to be the closest to our reconstruction. So when we reconstruct a root, when you compare English and Spanish and Russian and Irish, the Indian languages like Sanskrit seem to be the closest. So one theory was that must be the closest geographically. So maybe the people lived in northern India. Well, that was disproven. The second methodology for finding these people was, I'm just going to go ahead and call it racism, because it's based on this concept of an Aryan people. A, a famous book, Charles Morris's 1888, The Aryan Race, that he proposed. He actually called the language family Indo-Aryan instead of Indo-European. And for reasons based primarily in terms of racial superiority, said, no, 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 it can't be in India, it's got to be someplace with a Germanic people, possibly Scandinavia, say southern Sweden. We no longer believe that either. The winning methodology, the one which is modern, really began in 1877 with Adolf Pictet, and it's called linguistic paleontology. Let's take that apart. Linguistics, you're getting familiar with that. Study of language. In this case, that's the reconstruction of roots. And linguistic paleontology puts that together with the study of fossils and buried artifacts. So it's basically linguistics plus archaeology. And that's what this lecture is about. Linguistic paleontology rests on some assumptions. The first assumption is that if you look at the Indo-European languages across their range, and you find common or similar words all the way from Ireland all the way over into Russia and down into India. If there's a common root, and this people split up many, many, many thousands of years ago, it, the only logical assumption is that that common root goes all the way back to the beginning, like a genetic variation, which is uh, held in, in multiple peoples across the world. It didn't just pop up randomly in the same way in all those people. It means they have a common ancestor. So a common root in Indo-European means it's original. On the other hand, take a word for, I don't know, microwave. There's a different word for microwave in Irish and Russian and Northern Indian words unless it was borrowed recently. Well, that would mean that the Proto-Indo-Europeans made up or borrowed a new word for that after they split up and went their separate ways, and not that they had a common original word for microwave. 
The second assumption is the crucial one. If we know their roots, that is, if we go through all of the Indo-European languages and find the original roots, the ones that go all the way back, we know what words they spoke. And if we know some of the words they spoke, we know something about what they spoke of. And what they spoke of, and also the negative evidence of what they did not talk about, gives us clues to where they lived and when they lived if you happen to have the tools of archaeology and paleontology to match up with those words. See where we're going? So let's start investigating what words are held in common by the Indo-European languages and thus go all the way back and we're pretty sure were spoken by the Proto-Indo-Europeans. We'll start in the negative column. They had no common word for city, which means they lived in small groups. Those are tribal people. I'm going to give you a number of roots, and I'll point out things about them. Often I'll point out that, hey, there was this root many, many, many thousands of years ago, and it went its separate ways into, Eng into English, Spanish, Russian, Irish, Bulgarian, Sanskrit. And then often those words, because English has gone around the world, often those words themselves all ended up back in English. So it's like things start flowing out of Proto-Indo-European. They go around the world, and they all kind of wash downhill into English. Many of them do, at least. So I'll both be pointing out some interesting sort of tidbits about words that came from this route, and we'll also be building a picture of their world and their habitat. And at the end of the lecture, I'll reveal our best theory as to where they lived and when they lived and who they were. So we start off with wake, a word for clan or tribe. Gives us the English word, E is English, uh, word vicar. That's a British term for sort of the, the priest or, or preacher for a, a small area. Also vicinity, a small area. In Spanish, it comes out looking a little different, villa. Interestingly, this gives us the English word villain. What's the relationship? Even back in Shakespeare's time, the word villain still had echoes of its original meaning of a person from a small town, from a villa, not a city. Not a city person, but someone from, from the boondocks. Someone from Alton, that's a small town near here. Not from Chicago. And what do you get if you're not, if you don't go to the city to get rich? You're from a small town, you're poor. Poor people often end up stealing the bread they need to live. You end up associated with crime, and thus villa, villa, becomes the modern sense villain. It also, with a slight sound switch, gives us place names ending in which, like uh, Glenwich, Norwich, um, Eastwich. We know they had a word for house, so hey, we know they lived in houses. Good for them. Dame was their root. Notice the asterisk, of course, meaning it's reconstructed. It goes into Latin, so, so picture one splinter group breaking off and say, hey, we're going to go down to this peninsula, which will become the Roman Empire and the Latin language, and gives us domus. English gets a lot of words from that, domestic, domain, things to do with houses, dominion, even the word dome, which is sort of house-shaped. Some people lived in dome-shaped houses. When it goes all the way west into Europe, into the Germanic lands, it, the D changes to a T. It gives us another word in Germanic language, timbron, which gives us timber. So yes, domus and timber are related. They have the same root. What's the conclusion, if you're thinking in archaeological terms, that they built their houses out of witches, rocks, tiny stones? No, wood, that they did not build in stone. They built out of wood. And we can identify those civilizations archaeologically. So, food and drink. Ed, we know that they ate things. That's good. Otherwise, they'd be a bunch of hungry Proto-Indo-Europeans. They had the root ed. Gives us Latin edo, which is to eat. That's why we have edible. Well, what did they eat? Well, we know they had salt. You have to have it for your body. It's been a currency before. Uh, in fact, it passes straight into Latin as sal, meaning salt, and that gives us the English word salt. It also gives us salad, which, 
originally meant just a, a seasoned dish, like, like a salted dish, or salsa, which is also a kind of seasoning or seasoned dish. It also gives us the word salary. Korean words like this, I'll just pause. Roman soldiers, when they were paid back in the Roman Empire, you couldn't pay them in, in a common currency because there was no common currency. They were fighting all over what we would think of as Europe and Northern Africa, all the way to the Middle East. But what is universally valued as a preservative to preserve meat back before refrigeration? Salt. So our word salary goes back to salt. This is a category I want you to keep your eye on because there'll be at least two more words, maybe three, where a modern word, which is a, a monetary word, goes back to something which was originally a commodity, a thing. More food and drink. Graino. The word grain. It's fun to see what words, and you should be thinking word story all the time, what words come from the Latin version of Proto-Indo-European European grano. Granum gives us gram, the, the weight, metric weight, which was originally a grain of something. Gives us granite, a grenade, before it explodes, looks a little bit like a, a grain. And even pomegranate, that part of the root. That's through Latin. Through Old English, which is a Germanic branch of Proto-Indo-European, it comes to us as kernel, and the ga has changed to a ka. You see those two are related, right? Ga, ka. It is the velar stop, voiced and unvoiced. So the, uh, the voiced stop became unvoiced. And, instead of, and the R jumps over the vowel. R's do that. So instead of grain, we have corn. It's the same word, two different versions. So corn is a grain. They also had honey. And their root for honey was melet. That gives us words like molasses. Through French, it gives us mousse. I had to look that up. Uh, when you uh, brew honey, you get mead. That's actually our next root down there. And it's really interesting that um, before beer, before wine, brewed honey was a very common beverage. It's called mead. I've had some. It's kind of sickly sweet. One was good. Another one I had is kind of disgusting. The one they called Chaucer's Mead, that's in my office right now. That was disgusting. Poor Chaucer. In any case, nearly every Indo-European language has a cognate of mead, meaning that they took their practice of brewing honey, drinking honey beer, with them all around. And when you brew, you get kind of a froth on top, and that froth from brewing honey into mead gives us mousse. I'm also very fond of mellifluous. So if the mel in mellifluous is honey, the fluo, what does that sound like? Flowing. So if someone has a mellifluous voice, they have a voice which is flowing like honey. Isn't that lovely? So in terms of in search of, we need a place where honeybees live and they don't live everywhere. For instance, not east of the Urals, the mountain range separating uh, Europe on the west from Asia on the east. Agriculture. Well, we know that they domesticated bulls. They had the word tauro. That gives us through Latin the Ford Taurus, which is a car. Also the astrological sign, Taurus. And through Spanish, torreador or tor, which is a word for bull and also a mower. They also domesticated sheep which to them were owe, comes down to us very close in the word you. And they had a word peku, and we're going to pause on this word as well. Peku was their word for wealth or property, but it has an interesting secondary meaning. It also means cattle. In Latin, the word pecunia means cattle, and it comes into English as a word which does not mean cattle, it means money. It's a kind of uh, ACT word that you might not use every day. Pecuniary means uh, financial, money related. So pecuniary is our second word, which today is monetary, but was originally a commodity, a kind of property that a farming and uh, animal domesticating culture would have. 
This word looks a little different. It doesn't start with a P, it starts with an F sound, German FI. F-I is your IPA for the P-I-E. Oh, so sorry. German FI today is the word for livestock. And related to that is the English word FI. So with a sound shift from the P to the F, you get fee, like to pay a lawyer's fee. But the original meaning of fee, German fee, and proto and European peku was how many cows do you have? So they paid their lawyers in cows. And that's how they could afford their Tauruses and their Toro mowers. So we're looking for an agricultural society and a place where there are bees, not a hunter-gatherer society, the domesticated animals. You can find the bones of these animals in, in different burial mounds. And, and burial sites, or, or dig sites, I mean to say. And you can use carbon dating, see how old they are, and you can use DNA tests and bone size tests to see what kind of animals they are. And of course, you're looking for fossils of the Prius as well. We know that they had salmon. And that's my favorite fish. Uh, their word was lox. And that is exactly how you say the word lox. I don't know, if unless, unless you're from New York or Philadelphia, if you are, you've probably had lox on bagels before. Some lox on some cream cheese or maybe like a rye bagel. That is just delicious. That word lox is about six, 7,000 years old. In addition to having salmon, talking about salmon, they had horses. Equo sounds a lot like the Latin word equus, which gives us someone who rides a horse, an equestrian. In addition to horses and salmon, they love their pigs. Two roots, pig-related. Porco, which gives us pork, and su, which gives us sow and swine. So a lot of ribs. I'm picturing them as a rib-eating people. They also had a quan, which is dog. It begins with a K sound, ca. In Latin, you start to see a word we know, canis. That's the way you, you get canine. A group of dogs, wolves, those are canines. The German version, again, looks a little different. There's a sound shift. We'll, we'll study that later. But believe me, the H beginning sound is related to the K beginning sound. K, H. They're not that different. Back of the mouth, right? Hund is related to canine. So a hound is a canine. We don't need to go through the details, but they also had words for otter, beaver, wolf, deer, mouse, not moose, hare, wasp, and hornet. So you've got to do your historical kind of meteorology and climate science and figure where where's a place that had all of these animals, as well as domesticated animals in bone fragments. We know that's not tropical. It has to be inland because salmon spawn in rivers, and they domesticated those animals. Clothing and materials. They had clothing. It's good. They could wear clothing and eat things. Uh, they had the root tex, meaning to weave. So you'd be looking in that same uh, burial or, or archaeological dig site for not just the bones of these certain animals, but hopefully fragments of textiles. And by the way, textile woven uh, thread is the same root that gives us text, like a book, which is a metaphor, woven words. That lovely. They had wes, which is clothing. So I think they wore a lot of vests because that gives us Latin vestire, vestire to clothe. They had sne, which is to sew, and this is really crucial. They only had one metallurgical term. So in terms of material science, what they had to work with in their environment, they had bronze, copper. We're not sure which exactly it meant, but one of the two. Their word ias for bronze or copper gives us ore. They did not have any other metal terms. And that's really crucial because now we know we're looking for a Bronze Age civilization with artifacts of woven clothing. And we are hot on the hunt for the Proto-Indo-Europeans. In terms of transportation, they had weg, which gives us the Latin weho, which is vehicle, as well as the German wagen, like Volkswagen, Volkswagen, you know it as, the people's wagon, which gives us wagon. So vehicle and wagon, which also gives us way, are the same. They had a root ret, 
which meant to roll or a wheel. And this gives us a lot of words. Through Latin, both rotate, to turn something, like to roll it around in a circle, and radius, and even radiate. All similar looking words. And if you have German to your Latin, you know that rad is a bicycle, which has wheels. All of these things have, well, wagons, vehicles have axles. So you can go looking for evidence of wheeled wagons driven by horses or oxen with evidence of axles. The head families. This is not surprising. I mainly put these in so I could show you some English word pairs which seem different, but in fact go back to the same root. So everyone has a father, but if someone is father-like, they are not fathernal, they're paternal. Just note the P and the F, how Latin keeps the P from the original Proto-Indo-European, but in Germanic, and English is Germanic, that P shifts to an F, P to F. Both in the front of the mouth, you can see how that would happen. So if you go to a college where they have a group of guys like that living in a house, it's not a paternity, it's a fraternity. And for that, we need brother. I skipped uh, maternal and mother. That's also Latin and German roots. Frater and bruder gives us fraternity and brother. So brothers in a fraternity. There's an F and a B corresponding. And they had sisters. And if that group were women, that would not be a cisternity. It would be a sorority. Similar word, but using the Latin version of suesor rather than the Germanic version, which gives us sister. They had another word, nepot. It meant grandson or maybe just descendant. And as I mentioned earlier, Sanskrit in India, very similar, napat. Latin, relatively similar. Nepos is the word for descendant. You probably know that word in nepotism. It's when someone gives a relative a job. If the president gives a brother or a spouse or a child a job, we call that nepotism. Well, in the last slide, or the one before, we started getting used to Latin P's corresponding to English and Germanic F's. And so we can start adding some to our spin the vowel, look for cognates game. P's and F's can sometimes alternate. Nepotism is really just nephutism. They also had words for son's wife, husband's mother, husband's father. In other words, words for relative of the male. However, the negative, absent, uh, negative evidence is also really interesting. They had no words for, say, the daughter's husband or the wife's mother. Pause and think what that would mean about the way their family organization was set up. And that will be a word on the, a question on the homework. They had a word for the clan, the people, the tribe, tuta. Through German, that gives us Deutsch with an oi sound. Deutsch is the German word for German, German flag on the left. Have you noticed though how Deutsch is similar to the English word Dutch, which is the word for people from the Netherlands or Holland. That's the flag on the right. That confusion, because these both go back to the same word for the people, is why in uh, Pennsylvania, you have the Pennsylvania Dutch. You've heard of this group, maybe? The problem is Pennsylvania Dutch people are not Dutch. They did not come from the Netherlands. They came to Ellis Island and said, hello, we are Deutsch. And the people on Ellis Island thought they were saying Dutch. And so they got labeled Dutch. They're not Dutch, they're German. They speak a variety of German. It's also interesting to note that the word German in German is Deutsch, which just means the people, the tribe. It means us, basically, not you, us. That's true of a lot of like people names. A lot of Native American people names just mean us, you know, the people, not you over there, us. 
They had kings. The word for king, their root was reg, Sanskrit, Raj. And I give this to you because I bet you've heard the term Maharaja. Maha, if you have some Latin, Magnus is, is great. And Raja would be Rex, as in Tyrannosaurus Rex, the tyrant king in Latin. So Maharaja, that's perfect Sanskrit, is Magnus Rex in Latin. And Sir William Jones would be pointing and going, aha, aha. Well, from that same Latin Rex through French, roi, we get English royal. And not through French, we get regal, straight through Latin. All of those cognate words. This is fun. They had ghosty, which meant a stranger. And ghosty bifurcates, which means it goes in two different directions. The first direction it goes in goes through Latin and gives us words which mean a stranger that has stranger danger. Hostile or hostage. However, the same root, notice the similarity, goes positive too. Another side of that word goes into Latin hospitem, which is things gives us the words like host or hospitality or hospital, as well as through the Germanic branch, guest. So hostile or host, those are opposites, but the words are basically the same. What I take from that is this is their word for, oh look, someone's coming, it's a stranger. Do they mean us harm or will they be friends? They have uncertain intentions, which is why you have opposite meanings in the same word for stranger. Religion is fascinating. Here we want to look at two roots, diu, meaning to shine, and daios. They look relatively similar, d plus a vocalic kind of sound. The first means to shine. If you're up on your Germanic mythology, you've heard of Tu, who is the Germanic god of the sky and also of war. You've definitely heard of him because he gives us the word Tu in Tuesday. And day of the week is named after him. Our days of the week are named after German gods. Monday, moon. Tuesday, Wednesday is Woden. Thursday is, it's a movie about him, Thor, right? But that same root, du, which gives us the German god, tu, gives us the Latin word, Jove, the high god in the Roman culture, as well as the Greek, Zeus with a slightly different beginning vowel sound, consonant sound. So yes, Jove and Zeus and Tu are all in fact cognates of the same root. And they are cognates of another version of that root, a related Proto-Indo-European root is Deus, which gives us Latin Deus or Divus, which is deity or divine. So we've got shine words, and we've got God words. Conclusion, they worshiped a sky god. That's why Deus and Zeus, Deus the Latin word for God, and Zeus are similar. Cool, right? Here's another level of cool. Jupiter is sort of the full Latin word for the high god, Jupiter. That's two Indo-European roots. You know them both. I'll give you the Latin words. Jupiter is Deus Pater. So what does that mean? They worshipped a sky god, that's in the shiny part, in the Deus, whom they thought of as their paternity test, father, a father god in the sky. Interesting, huh? Some generalizations. When you look at all the Indo-European languages, they do not have common words for ocean. In other words, if you travel from English to German to French to Spanish to Irish to Bulgarian to Russian to Greek to Latin to uh, Sanskrit, they all have different words for ocean that don't seem to be in common, which means that original people did not talk about oceans. And remember our, our assumption? Therefore, they didn't live near oceans. Nor are there similar words for olive, pear, grape, monkey, rhinoceros, elephant, camel, tiger. You can see what we're ruling out, right? They didn't live in the Serengeti. They didn't live near the ocean. 
There's no parrot bamboo rice palm. They didn't live in a tropical area. So where and when did they live? We're looking for a place with salmon, inland rivers, certain animals and honeybees, where it snowed, by the way. And we're looking for archaeological digs with evidence of agriculture, certain animals domesticated, textiles, axles, bronze, but not iron, metal, uh, iron tools, wooden houses, possibly sky god worship. I didn't tell you about this, but also burial mounds. And when you put the words together with what we know of archaeology and weather and where animals lived, we get the Kurgan hypothesis. The person who cracked this, who gave us the modern theory, is Maria Gimbutas of UCLA back in the 50s. Look at her job. She's a professor of what? Linguistics and archaeology. Do you see how people who sort of do two things and not just one, who have a broad liberal education, who are, who are broadly or are multiply specialists, they often can make connections that uh, narrowly focused people cannot. So she puts archaeology together with linguistics, says, I found it. This would be the people who lived in the steppes of southern Russia, which split and spread beginning in about 3500 BC, i.e. 5500 plus 6,000, 7,000 even maybe years ago they lived in what we would call modern day Ukraine in a place called Sredny Stok. Where is that? I thought I had another map, but I don't. So think about it. Pause. Whatever your biological eth ethnicity, whether you came from England, Nigeria, Poland, Cameroon, China, if you're speaking English, or Spanish, or French, or Irish, Gaelic, or German, or Russian, Romanian, Bosnian, Bulgarian, Greek, Latin, or even Iranian, not, however, Arabic, or Hebrew, or Finnish, Hungarian, or Basque, then you have a linguistic ancestor that goes back so much further than Ancestry.com could ever imagine going. Probably 6,000 years ago in, there's my map, the Caucasus Mountains area, north of that in the steppes between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in modern-day Ukraine. That is where your linguistic ancestors, Grandpa and Grandma Proto-Indo-Europeans, originally lived. How many people can say that? About a third of them. Three billion people today speak an Indo-European language. This is where they are. You can see that there's many of them in Europe, spreading throughout Russia. You can see they're in the Indian subcontinent. The green is Iran. And then you want to think colonization. So where did the colonial powers go in the 18th, 19th century? All of North and South America through English and Spanish and Portuguese. Australia, down to the bottom right. The Indo-Europeans, these, these people who had their, their dogs and their pigs, and they ate their food, and they had their sisters, and they drove their Ford Taurus, their linguistic ancestors have spread out across the world. And this story, I'm telling to you because this is the beginning of the story of English. Our language's story begins with Proto-Indo-European story. Do you want to hear some? This is the Gospel of John, which begins, In the beginning was the Word, my favorite verse of the Bible, in Reconstructed Indo-European. I'm not sure this will play in a way you can hear, but I will try. Otherwise, I'll put the link on the homework. You, you heard Word? You heard Dewey, God? You heard est, like is?
I'll pause there. Couple observations. First of all, there's a gigantic asterisk in front of all of that, meaning this is all reconstructed. Those words don't exist in any paper, manuscript, papyrus, or stone. They're all reconstructions. And then we have to guess how they would have been pronounced, but people have gotten pretty good at this Proto-Indo-European reconstruction. That is our best guess about the sound of Proto-Indo-European, which is English's earliest traceable ancestor.